Our final panelist is uh, Mr. Stephen Wallman. He is the founder and CEO of Folio FN Incorporated, an online brokerage and investing company that delivers brokerage, investing, and portfolio management services to financial services firms, investment advisors, and individual investors. Um, he is also the founder of Folio FN's wholly owned subsidiary, Proxy Governance, uh, a proxy research and governance firm that prover provides services to mutual funds, pension fund, money managers, and other fiduciaries. Uh, but before he founded Folio FM, Mr. Wallman served uh, at the, as a commissioner of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission from 1994 to 1997. At the SEC, he played a leading role in formulating policies that brought the internet and other advanced technologies into widespread use within the securities industry, and he helped to convert U.S. trading markets from fractions to decimals, a move that saved investors billions of dollars by reducing the spread. Before he joined the commission, he was a partner uh, at Covington, Covington and Burling, and uh, he received his law degree from Columbia University, and he holds two degrees from MIT, including an MS from the Sloan School of Management. He's also a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in DC. Mr. Wallman. Thank you. Um, I find this interesting because uh, I, I generally am not in a position where I'm agreeing with almost everybody's comments from before, especially when they're so diverse. But this actually is a pretty interesting panel since you've heard a number of different perspectives, but there's an awful lot of convergence in those perspectives. And I think it's very much like the old um, adage about people trying to describe an elephant from different perspectives. And some talk about how it seems very rough and others talk about how smooth it is. Some are feeling the skin, some are feeling the tusk, et cetera. And what we have is a, a huge morass of issues that have come to the head because of the financial services debacle that we've seen over the last couple of years. The cause of this, uh, I think, is, is reasonably well understood in terms of there being, for too long, low interest rates uh, coming out of the dot-com bust. Uh, a result of that being a housing bubble, the result of that being too many people thinking that housing prices would only go up. A uh, result of that being people willing to make no documentation loans uh, at very low interest rates with variable rates that would then go up afterwards uh, and people not understanding the risk. Homeowners thinking that they could simply flip their houses later on for profits that were reasonably well guaranteed uh, and everyone buying into that. I don't know about you in the audience, but I know that most of us uh, including a lot of sophisticated people, thought that housing prices generally weren't going to be able to slip 40 percent, at least not very quickly, uh, and that a lot of people bought houses with the expectation that that was in fact going to be their main asset. So we had, in, in a certain sense, a contagion that spread across the entire American public. Uh, when we look at who bought the subprime mortgages as they became securitized, uh, and there was obviously a principal agent problem uh, from a lawyer's perspective, we all know that, and we were all looking at the fact that the folks who were originating these mortgages, in fact, weren't spending terribly much time worrying about what would happen in the event of a default, because generally speaking, they didn't expect to own them. Uh, they were going to be selling them to third parties. Uh, what you ended up with, though, were an awful lot of very sophisticated people buying those mortgages and thinking that because of the way that they had been structured with tranches uh, and the diversification and the lack of any kind of homogenous view as to who in fact was buying into the subprime mortgage marketplace, uh, that the likelihood of some kind of systemic or endemic uh, collapse of the entire uh, uh, group of assets uh, was not something that was really likely. And so you ended up with a lot of smart people in a lot of high places and in a lot of large institutions betting a lot of money on the idea that we would be able to continue to sustain high returns coming out of what was now a securitized mortgage marketplace that was diversified because of the way that the tranches had been set up. Risk was therefore reasonably well allocated. The credit rating agencies knew what they were doing. Uh, and the rest is somewhat history. The question is, what do we do about it going forward? What have we done about it to create less of a risk going forward? Have we solved any of the problems that we saw? And what are the solutions uh, that we need to look at as we proceed? 
And that, I think, is really where the rubber meets the road. That's where I think you've got real differences of opinion. Uh, I agree absolutely that there needs to be a commission examining some of the issues that have occurred to date. There seems to be a sense of favoritism. There seems to have been sort of picking and choosing winners without an awful lot of qualitative or quantitative analysis behind how you select the winners from the losers. Uh, the determination as to what to do with Lehman versus what to do with Bear Stearns versus what to do with a bunch of others, including, as we should remember, entities like Wachovia and others uh, that have disappeared that used to be some of the top banks around for an awful long time. Uh, and as we look to see who ended up being the winner and who ended up getting government funds to buy somebody else, um, those were decisions that seem on their face to be less than completely fair and less than completely rational. So one would agree that uh, some commission studying that would be useful, uh, if for no reason other than to ensure that when this occurs again, and let there be no mistake, this will occur again. Uh, we will end up in a financial crisis again. Uh, and there's a new book that just came out that talked about, uh, this time it's different, 800 years of financial bubbles, uh, which <laughs> sort, of, sort of in its title I think summarizes the entire point. Uh, when, we, when we think about that, uh, what we're going to end up with is the question of whether or not we can do better next time we have to do something on an emergency basis. And so commissions, I think, are useful. Uh, and sometimes they can actually come to not bad solutions as to how you might put in place some kind of protection for the future. With regard to where we currently are, though, it's interesting to note that when you look at the, the numbers from, for example, just June 30th of 2008, the top 10 bank holding companies had about 63% market share in terms of U.S. banking assets, and the top four had about 48%. A reasonably concentrated industry uh, and one that one might be concerned about, uh, but numbers that certainly are not within uh, sort of expectations of being way, way too concentrated. After an awful lot of effort, energy on the part of the Treasury Department and the Fed, awful lot of activity in Congress, uh, trillions of dollars literally, because we only look at the 700 billion TARP dollars, uh, but there are trillions of dollars that have gone out in terms of guarantees and subsidies uh, to large institutions. With all that designed to try to affect and to address in a way that would actually help us for the future, the issue of companies, be, of bank holding companies being too big to fail, what did we get? Well, if you look at it a year later, the top 10 now have about 80% market share, up from 63, and the top four now have about 56%, up from 48. Uh, one might view that as a pretty remarkable failure. Uh, the whole idea was to try to eliminate or at least reduce the potential of entities being too big to fail. And what we've done is, with an awful lot of work, a lot of energy, a lot of mind share, we've made sure that they're now much bigger. And if there was any doubt previously that entities were too big to fail, we've now guaranteed that there are, there are entities that are too big to fail. In addition to that, uh, we were complaining about the questions of moral hazard. We wanted to ensure that whatever we put into place would not create moral hazards. I don't know if folks remember, but a couple of years ago, some of us suggested looking at the actual systemic cause of the problems instead of trying to solve uh, in terms of the symptoms, looking at what was actually creating some of the current liquidity issues and pricing issues, and that was housing, and to come up with solutions to help the housing market. Uh, the answer for that being rejected was we don't want to create moral hazard. We might have a position where a lot of small investors and individual homeowners will now think that what they can do is they can go out, buy houses, and the government will bail them out if their bet on housing doesn't work. So what we did instead was we ended up going to a lot of large institutions and we said, you made a lot of bets, and they weren't very good bets, well, we'll bail you out instead. I'm not quite sure how the moral hazard of trying to help individual homeowners would have been far worse than the moral hazard of trying to help some very large institutions. And so if we look at the government's efforts on two fronts, one is trying to eliminate the potential problems for in the future too big to fail, and the issue of not ensure or not creating more moral hazard, I think we have not succeeded very well on either one.